Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our podcast today. I am so excited to talk to Bradley Gassman, who is the safety director of AGC, Associated General Contractors of Colorado. And I am super curious, Bradley, of just diving, we'll just get right into this, but diving into how you got into safety, which always seems to be a wild story for people of, I kind of got thrown into safety or maybe it was intentional, but, um, but yeah, I guess we could start there. How in the world did you get into this profession? All right. Well, I'll make it as short as possible. But uh, so when I got out of high school, I, I started college and I started in hotel restaurant management Okay. and soon found out that that was not a path that I wanted to take. And you went to college. I did some, re- I did my research. You went to college in Missouri. Is that right? Well, that's where I graduated from, but I started my college career at Oklahoma State University. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, And then um, I decided that maybe um, uh, physical or athletic training, pre-physical therapy would be a good path to go down. I had had a couple knee surgeries I enjoyed the interaction with the physical therapist and rehabbing the knee. And I thought, wow, this is really great. So I went to Kansas University okay. and uh, was there. But um, at that time, I started building houses in the summer to pay for college and expenses. Um, and as we all know, that's an extremely dangerous uh, job. Um, not a whole lot of safety regulations, especially with custom home builders that are small, like I work for. So I knew nothing about tool safety, scaffolding, <laughs> fall protection, none of that stuff. So, um, and my dad worked in construction, so he wanted me to talk to the safety director at his company. So I went in and did that. This individual gave me some videotapes to watch, but then also said, hey, have you ever thought about safety? I said, no. So he had me go visit Central Missouri State University with one of his newest graduates from there. And lo and behold, I liked what I heard. And I enrolled right there and got out of my classes and apartment at KU and was back at school um, within a couple months at uh, can't. At, what was it? Central Missouri State University at my at the time I went there. It's no longer that. It's oh. University of Central Missouri now. And so, when you graduated, then did you immediately start with a safety level position? And what kind? What company did you start with? Yeah. So um, once I got about a semester under my belt in the safety, um, I started doing an internship for Black and Veatch. Okay. Um, who's a worldwide constructing and engineering firm. Okay. Um, so I started do. I did an intern with them. After my intern, the um, director of safety asked if I would like to just work at Black and Veatch while I finished school. So I got all my sk- classes scheduled to where I could come back to from Warrensburg to Kansas City, which is only about an hour drive, but I could okay. get uh, get there on Tuesdays or Thursdays or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and work. Um, and, and then, yes, after I finished my bachelor's, they asked me to get my master's. I saw that. So I did go ahead and get my master's degree. At the same time, I was working full time now for Black and Veatch, getting my master's degree. And then once I got that, then, yes, I was a full time employee, no more school and off to my jobs and started doing job site safety management across the United States. Well, that so something that you said you when you were learning about the occupation and you said, I kind of like what I heard and I like what I was seeing. What was that? What you know, you're going to school, you're learning about you're learning about standards, regulations, occupational health and safety. What hooked you? Was it so much the classroom? Was it so much the the on the job experience? And what what about safety interested you in the beginning? Yeah, so you know, really, when when I went down there, I I, I saw the coursework, and a lot of it was very interesting. You know, your accident investigation, your fire sciences; those are things that that really interested me. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then once I started working for Black and Veatch, you know, it was it was like, wow, there's a clear focus on a path forward after college. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what lacks, I think, in in some of our universities and the curriculums is that people get into these, um, you know, focused, you know, curriculums like business administration or, you know, law, but do they really have a clear path on what they're going to be doing with that? It wasn't what they thought it was. It wasn't, and I can relate because I have my bachelor's in occupational health and safety. And it was uh, funny because I was, I was doing that full-time going to school full-time and working full-time for a trucking oil and gas construction type of company and in alt Colorado and everything was lining up because like you said, uh, having a course on accident investigation, it was like, what would you do if the skidster tipped over? I'm like, I just did that last week. Like, this is so hand in hand. And I love that. I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I could definitely relate. So did you see, I mean, so you started working for a pretty big company um, yes. off the bat. And so um, what was that experience like? What did their safety program look like high level? What impressed you about their, their safety culture? Well, I think you hit it on the head just by by one word, the culture. I mean, they the the my mentor Richard King, mm-hmm. um, who was the director of safety and health for all of Black and Veatch, um, you know, he developed a culture, and he was one of those individuals that provided you with the tools but didn't necessarily take the time to just sit down and dig deep into the details. He's like, here's, here's the tools. You kind of figure it out. And and so it gives you a a little bit of autonomy to, you know, start digging and makes, it really makes you start researching the standards and the, the company safety and health manual. Um, And then, getting out on the jobs. Now you're starting to have to relate to people on the job sites and you start meeting a bunch of personalities and, you know, all these guys from different crafts. Um, And and it was just, it was just something that was, you know, really um, exciting to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you go on the job sites and you see the culture, I mean, it was almost like, at times, uh, it's it's kind of weird to say this, but it was almost like times like I didn't feel like I was really needed on the job site because um, they were because the culture was already built out and established. Was strong. I mean, you you know you have a very transient workforce when you're in construction, so there's are those few people that come from other companies, other geographic areas to start working for the company and they're not really there yet, but I'm there and the the core craftsperson are there. And mm-hmm. so they kind of watched their, you know, they're their brother's keeper and, and there was a really good culture there where they watched each other and they, hey, we don't do it that way. And, um, you know- It wasn't it, tolerated, just the no. nonsense, what, was so interesting. I haven't had a chance really to talk to somebody who started their safety career at a, a top notch company like that, you know, where they're, they had a built out had built out systems and processes and the culture yeah. was there. And so that is, that's amazing. That's fascinating. And so, and you're, what I hear you saying is that being unsafe wasn't tolerated. The mindset, of course, things happen. But yep. what you're saying is that it just wasn't tolerated in the culture. And so what do you see now, now having worked with several companies, just even through AGC, you're able to, in connections, through, through connections, you're able to see people's safety program. What do you think is lacking um, in the majority of businesses today? when they're trying to build a safety program, they're trying to build culture. What have you really seen for your clients and customers that they're missing? 
Um, you know, we've we've really come a long ways since I've started, and technology is a big deal now. And so sometimes I'm I'm thinking, and and, and I've worked for companies where their safety programs are so cumbersome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it takes your frontline supervision out of the field, and and you just need to have those guys, you know, off of these tablets. You need them out in the field. You need them to be a person, personable to each and every person. You you know, you know, you need to spend that time in the field, and that's what I contribute my early success to was. I'd stay late to do and come in early to do paperwork and do administrative tasks. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the time I spend in the field, I'm walking around, I'm looking at things, I'm talking to people, I'm learning, hey, how do you have to do this job? What's, you know, here's where we're at. What's the end piece look like? How can we do this incorporating safety into it? So I'd be learning kind of that what you know what they have to do and try and incorporate safety into it so it was on the job is what i my mind just went so many different places hearing you say that so let's say that we have a listener today that they're they're uh brand new in the safety industry they just are starting their career and they're trying to make an impact in, at, at their company what would be some advice that you would give me starting for let's say a construction company with a few hundred employees, how do I get started? And what do you recommend that I, I do right away? Uh, the first thing is you read the company safety and health manual and okay. you understand it front to back. I mean, that's absolutely imperative. Because if you, you know, don't know it and you're right. the safety director, right. I see. Okay. And, you know, again, my father always told me one thing that I always use. There's a difference between being on time and not being late. And what that means is that you don't come in at two minutes to seven o'clock in the morning when that seven o'clock work starts. You oh. come in, you get ready, and you're able to be out there in the field ready to go at seven o'clock. In fact, you could be kind of just out there pacing around for a few minutes and that's being on time. Um, I love that. And, and so that's something I've always lived by. That's something I've always told safety managers that work for me is to get, don't, don't just come in right before the bell rings um, and don't run out the door at the end. You know, one thing I always did as well is I stood at the gate every night and said goodbye to every single crass person that walked off the job site. Oh my gosh, and Bradley. Yes. That is how you build respect. That's how you build relationships. That's how, you know, if you went to most of the jobs I was on, you could probably ask anybody who's the safety manager and they knew exactly who, oh, it's that little dude, Brad. Um, <laughs> they, so they knew, knew you. Who, they knew who I was. <laughs> um, so that's one thing you do is you, you know, spend the time getting to know people. And that's not just at the end of the day, that's throughout the day. You know, you can go up and talk to a craftsperson, you know, once they're, you can take a few minutes of their time. It's that's, there's nothing that says you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, get to know them, their names, try to use people, you know, call people by their first names. Um, something I always thought was important was making sure that we had names on hard hats. Um, I love that. Always got that. Know a little bit about these people. And after, you know, the core craftsmen, you, you learn real quick who, you know, their names and what they do just because they, they go to job to job with you. Um, but the, the other thing is, is just, like I said, staying in the field, be in the field, ask the questions though. Don't just go out there and start pointing and yelling and shouting, but being a safety cop. Yeah. Understand what they have to do and you have to mesh safety with that. Um, you know, there's one of the perfect examples I had early on was, uh, you know, I had an issue with, uh, some welders that hard hats were off. And they had the what the call, what's called the pancake face mask, um, and they were working in a tighter space. And you know the safety and health manuals and the policy was you will wear your hard hat at all times while on the job site. Well, these are the types of situations where you can't always do that. So mm -hmm. you 
go in there and you figure out, well, why aren't you wearing your hard hat? Well, I've got to get in here. This is how much space I have. Um, these are the tools I have to have in there at the same time. And you start to understand, oh, okay, well, that's reasonable. And you start to understand that, hey, these guys did a, an analysis, did their task plan, showed that they were going to be taking their hard hats off, showed that they weren't having overhead hazards. Um, so, Exactly. You know, you just... Versus what you're saying, showing up on the job site, doing an audit where you're disengaged from the craftsman and you're writing up an audit saying people aren't wearing their PPE. And then you're submitting an audit to that person, to that crew supervisor. And there was no communication. You didn't take the time because the alternative of what you're saying is you didn't take the time to have a conversation with the guys and gals in the field to understand what the job site is and, or what the, what the task at hand is right. on the job site. And so Bradley, this information is golden for our listeners. If you're a, if you're new into this industry, if you're a safety director, um, someone on the leadership team, and you feel like you're not making an impact at your company, or you're looking to take your program to the next level, Bradley, what you just said, I think is everything is being in the field and connecting to your team members. Because if you're, in, and I'm sure you agree with me, if you're a disengaged safety director who hasn't made a relation, hasn't built relationships, hasn't taken the time to understand, like you said, the job task, and you're just pointing fingers, then there's going to be a you versus them mentality. And, and nobody mm -hmm. wants that. You're not going to make an impact there. So I love what you're saying is build relationships. And so um, what do you um, see is through COVID safety <laughs> programs through <laughs> so much, I won't get all into it, but have you seen a shift in safety culture through COVID? And if so, I, what have you seen maybe through AGC, through your members, um, what, what are on employees minds right now? What are the challenges that businesses are facing when it comes to their, to, when it comes to safety specifically? You know, I'm, I'm happy to say that I haven't seen a whole lot of negative awesome. on our job sites when it comes to COVID. Yes, we have our problems, our issues, you know, is, you know, making sure that our protocols are in place, making sure that people are following those protocols. And I know that some people get frustrated with, you know, you know, you come on a job site and you're doing your walk arounds and then they get disappointed with themselves because I might be there and I see that, you know, a group of folks over here aren't wearing their face masks and we have to remind them. Um, but that's normal stuff. I mean, it, it's, you, you, that's your job is to go out there just to remind people that, hey, we need to wear our face coverings, um, you know, please just comply with it. Making sure that we are talking to the individuals again. Yeah, hey, I love that. Is this the right face covering? Is are these the right glasses? What can I be doing to, you know, make it as comfortable as possible? Um, you know, the more comfort you have, the better off you are with PPE compliance. Um, but you know, I, I think it's yeah. I, I guess I, I just, I don't see a whole lot of issues when it comes to COVID and compliance on the job sites. I mean, that's awesome. it's awesome. Day to day. Now that's AGC. And I think there's, there's just a lot of these members at AGC that just get it. They and, get it. I, I, yeah, I see where you're coming from there. They're a part of the board or they're part of this organization because they most likely are, um, they value learning, they value education, they value innovation. And so they, they have those values, which is probably why they're part of the group. So that, that totally makes sense. And so, it, so that is awesome news. That's great. You know, I was just curious. I didn't have, you know, a, you know, a certain thing in mind there. So that's great to hear. And, and what do you see is the future as far as safety programs go, as far as training goes? Um, and we could talk specifically about training. What do you, how do you see the future of training and safety 
going right now? Um, well, um, it's, it's interesting. E everything, you know, the training that we provide, like let's just start with our stormwater training. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. You know, our attendance in the stormwater training is through the roof, right? Through the now. roof right now. Oh, wow. And so, that's a, in person or virtual? Virtual. Okay. And so, so what, what we, and, and this is because of COVID, but what we at AGC are looking to do, and this is with committees as well, and anything that we do is, is we want to make sure that coming out of this COVID era, that we have hybrid um, training. So basically, we're going to have in-person training, but at the same time, we'll have the means to um, do the training virtually as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've been able to transfer all the curriculum to online, as well as the tests, as well as, um, you know, instructor evaluations, all that stuff. So we can do a hybrid class. Okay. Can, and you see that the more... Do you see that being the future for the majority of safety courses that um, that either you provide or maybe the OSHA training institution in Colorado is more of the hybrid type and where we can still integrate? What I hear you saying too is that hands-on is still valuable and Absolutely. your students are valuing in-person connection, hands-on training. So I... I, I definitely second that. I agree that hands-on is always the way to go, but we're making we're making the best out of what we can. So, okay. But, and that's stormwater. What other courses? We um, want to make sure that you know we can get everybody in, and and so the virtual side of things is, um, you know, it's just extremely convenient. Not everybody can get off at a particular date and time to come and for such a duration to come in and sit down for a class. Right, so right. If we can still do these classes where we can get more people and more training done mm -hmm. across the board with using a hybrid, then that's something we, we want to keep doing. I love hearing that. And I know I just touched on training. What are some other best practices that um, at your level, you're able through AGC, able to work with um great companies and that probably have stellar safety programs and you're able to kind of uh, have a higher view, an overview of what people are trying, what's working, what's not working with their safety program. And so what are some best practices that you've seen safety directors adopt that have enhanced their company's safety culture or safety culture, their company as a whole? Hmm. I don't know if there's you know, certain things that come out that, that come to mind. Um, I don't know, it could be as tactical as certain trainings, um, incentive programs, or just some of these best practices that companies have shared with you. You know, when it comes to on-site um, and compliance and, you know, corrective measures, um, you know, let's say you have an observation process, you identify hazards. I think some of the companies that really excel um, are the ones that empower the employees more to, hey, here's an observation. Let's let you guys get together and, and let's look at some corrective measures and bring that to us. Let's see. And you get, you know, a lot of input. interaction. Yes. And you've got some very, very sharp minds in the construction industry. I think some people take that for granted that, Hey, you, he's a welder, he's an iron worker, he's an electrician, but there's some sharp, sharp minds and that, you know, really can bring a lot to the table. That's why a real good safety and health committee on job sites mm -hmm. a long ways too. So you can bring this stuff and, and it's, it's all about empowering them. Um, and, and again, you'll be coming up with, with really innovative ways of protecting a hazard mm -hmm. um, or improving your safety and health program. Um, so I, 
I didn't really answer your question about a, a specific best practice, but you know, that's, that's kind of, those are the companies that I see that have really solid programs. They've no, really that's, the people. that empower other people. And no, that is a, that is a clear practical tip that our listeners and viewers can take away today is if you're a safety director, safety manager, safety coordinator is if you're in a, a simple safety meeting or a training, try enhancing the level of engagement with your team members, with who your students are, because I agree with you. When I was just starting out, I'm like, I don't know it all. I obviously, I haven't started boots on the ground. So how am I going to build a relationship and a connection and, and bring value in this class when I am not the expert welder, when I'm not the equipment operator. And I found that the best thing I could do at that time was to get the team together, get the class together and break everybody into small groups. And let's start brainstorming some scenarios and some solutions that they came up with because they're the experts and to put a supervisor, these are some practical um, tips or some advices. Then I I'd have supervisors, you know, in each of these groups, these pods, and then they would brainstorm, Hey, this is, Hey, this, here's an incident um, that the company had last year. What are some different ways we could have gone, gone about it? What did we, what did we do wrong here? What are some best, things that we could do moving forward. So I agree with you pulling from, pulling from your employees because they're the experts Right. Um, and pulling from their experience is, is meaningful to them too. They have a voice in the class and that matters to them. So I, I love that. And, and so I think, I think one thing you said too, is, you know, take that into the training room as well. So let's say we're doing an OSHA 10 hour, why not bring an electrician in to do the electrical training? Why not? <laughs> Instead and, of- And then I you got peer to peer. And peer to peer means a lot. So, you know, that th those are very good points as well. Yeah, I agree. I think that when you can showcase, when we can showcase what the level of experience is in the room and we can, you know, let people shine and not always be- you know, not come off if you're a safety trainer as the know-it-all and I know everything, I'm an expert, but when you're willing to learn from your class as well, I think um, just really fosters a beautiful conversation in, you know, in whatever class that you're teaching, an OSHA 10, a stormwater class, but, but pull on people. I think that that's awesome. And so what are some of the things, um, talk, I want to move to culture, so I am so fascinated with this, with just the philosophy of we can train regulations till we're blue in the face, oh, yeah. but there's magic when we shift the conversation to more critical thinking skills, um, leadership, and we start talking about culture. And like I said, I was doing my research on you and I thought this was really, really cool as I saw that you uh, had posted something about David Goggins and- oh, yeah. What was that? I said yes. Yeah, I've I've read his book and and I I love the mindset side of things and I think safety directors uh, can safety professionals can often get the questions that I get a lot is well I, I'm teaching the regulations in the class and no one's listening I, I feel like I'm not getting that engagement and so. How what are some what's some practical advice that you would give to some listeners that could help a safety director talk more about mindset or how, how does mindset play a role in safety for you? That mindset and culture. And is that important when it comes to safety? Yeah. And I, I, I guess for, for me, it's, 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 um, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's just believing in, in what we're trying to do as safety managers, you know, and it, yeah. it, it has to come, it has to come from your heart. It yeah. can't just be a bunch of lip service. Okay. Um, and, and I don't know that everybody has to learn how to train in terms of mindset. Some people just are not good at training, but yeah. But 
as a good safety manager, you need to make sure that you're still surrounding your pe- yourself with good people. Yeah. And so yeah. you need to pull on those resources. Every, in fact, that's every manager. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Don't, Take the title off. Yeah. You don't get to be a CEO of a company by being the smartest man in the room. You don't. Right. You get to be a CEO because you, you have good people around you. And you know how to kind of give them their space and and time, tools, and materials so that they can grow and 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 help you out. Um, so, um, you know, I guess I didn't really answer the mindset thing, but uh, yeah, no, I think what I heard you say is you don't have to be the expert in mindset and leadership so much skills and the culture piece, but if you aren't, find people that are, and it's, or at least around yourself with a team of people that you can bring that to your employees. It doesn't necessarily need to come from you, but but to know that mindset's still important and, and find a way to bring it to the team. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Okay. All when, right. When I talk about mindset, it's just, um, you know, I'm pretty hard on myself. I want to have the best safety. I want to have that job site that excels and right. productivity is good as well. And we're under budget and we're on schedule and all that stuff. So for me, it's just making sure that I stay focused on that mm-hmm. and making sure that I'm doing everything I can to contribute to that. So if that means working that 15 hour day, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, and there's there's too many people that get into safety, I think, sometimes, and, and I don't mean this, I don't want to be mean, but there's a lot of people that get into this thinking that, hey, this is this is, it sounds like a pretty easy deal. Right. Well, yeah, you can skate through anything in life. <laughs> Accounting, uh, whatever, but I like what you said, being ex- Doing something is is one thing, but being excellent at something is a whole nother level of mindset. It's the it's what you're after. It's and that's exactly what David's talking about. You get yeah. it in your mind, and you say, "Here's the goal. What do I have to do to do to get there?" And and those are the things that I I focus on to try to make sure that I'm the best at what I've what I can do. I love that. I love the mind. I love what you're saying of that. You bring what you said and it really landed on me was I expect a lot from me first. Yeah. So I expect then a lot from, you know, if I, when you, when you're hard on yourself and you have expectations of greatness for yourself, then it shows out in everything that you do as a safety professional, as a dad, as you know, you, you show up with that, whether you're a leader in any position, any job. So I love that. And, um, that's, that's awesome. And, and what I'm not going to tell, ask anybody to do anything that I'm not willing to do. That's... So, you know, I've got site safety managers and I expect them to be at work at seven o'clock. And, um, when, you know, when I was working for the company as the regional safety director, I was also at the jobs at seven o'clock in the morning. Or I, 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 I practice what my father always said. I was on time and not being late. So I'd be there ahead of time and I'd watch some of these safety guys come in right at the last minute. And it just, it was frustrating. Nuts. Well, and it just, it, um, it shows the people around you too, that you're taking your job serious, right? I mean, we're trying to gain respect as safety directors too. And so when you show up ready and prepared, then the employees know that you mean business too. The craftsmen, they, they know that you're serious as well. And um, two big things that, that stood out about you, Bradley, is that your, your mindset for greatness and wanting to, to bring break, gr- bring greatness out into the job site, into whatever it is that you do. I, I find that fascinating. And then number two takeaway for our listeners is if you're trying to make an impact or you want to take your safety program to the next level, take your engagement to the next level yes. is what I hear you saying loud and clear. Get connected with your team. 
know their names, get to know a little bit something about them. Like you said, everyone could have a couple minutes here or there, but like really get to know the, 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 the people on the job and you'll start making a difference and an impact um, as a safety professional. So make I did it and make it personal. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Bradley, thank you so much for your time today. I know that you're so busy. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners um, that are just trying to take their safety program to the next level? Well, I hope that uh, just that they've, they kind of mine a couple nuggets out of our conversation. Um, Cause I honestly believe there's a lot of things that we talked about that, that I did practice from day one and, and it, it got me to where I'm at now. Um, and, and I think the biggest thing is, is, um, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to make these relationships first before you can, you know, you can't go out there and just start wagging the finger. You've got to get out there, make those relationships, make it personal. Like we just said, I mean, and, and you could probably do nothing else and you're still going to grow a pretty strong culture. I think, um, you know, because the people are going to start believing in you and believing that you care about that you really care about them. And that's I think that's the thing. And and employees will stick with a company when they know that that the company cares about them. Wow. I completely agree with you. Uh, oh, my goodness. Bradley, your wisdom and your advice and your knowledge today that was shared it was so valuable. Thank you so much again for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with us. So thank you guys for listening and please connect with Bradley. You can connect with him. We'll drop his links um, down into the podcast description to his social media. Um, But thank you guys so much for listening. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Thank you.